Welcome to our virtual service this Sunday morning, this Palm Sunday morning. Uh, I want to share with you that next week we will be having our service virtually again, but we're looking to do some special things for Easter Sunday. And so uh, we invite you to be a part of that. Also, I would uh, tell you that it seems the time when we will be able to get together safely is getting closer and closer as more and more people get vaccinated. If you have received either the one shot Johnson vaccination or, or both of the others, or even just one of the others, please call the church office or email the church office and, and let us know the status of where you are with your vaccinations. Uh, that will be very helpful. Those are the announcements I would share with you. I uh, invite you to drive by the church sometime if you get the chance and, and take a look at the beginnings of our new community garden. We have three trees planted that are avocado trees, Brogdon avocados that you can't get in stores. And when they finally are able to be harvested, they are absolutely delicious. And uh, it'll probably be a season or two before they're ready for harvesting, but 
We look forward to that. We're going to add some mango trees. We're going to uh, add some papayas from seeds. And we're also going to use the containers that we get the additional avocado trees and the uh, mango trees in to plant citrus trees, some Meyer uh, lemon trees, some uh, navel orange trees, uh, which are more resistant to the uh, citrus blight. And because we're going to use the containers to plant them in, if they become infected, we won't be digging up uh, trees out of the ground. We'll just take them out of the container and uh, start anew. So that's the beginnings of our garden. Many things are happening and will be happening over the months ahead. And I uh, look forward to keep sharing that with you. Those are all the announcements that I would share. I would invite you to join with me as we affirm our faith in Christ through the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. Amen, and so be it forever and ever. Our opening hymn is one of the great Palm Sunday hymns, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Scripture lesson uh, continues in the Gospel of John, and it is a very powerful lesson 
John has put it at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. In the first three Gospels, Jesus' ministry primarily takes place in the Galilee region. In John's Gospel, it takes place primarily in Jerusalem because of the clash between Jesus the Messiah and the traditional faith of the Hebrew people. And so it begins with this very powerful story that I'm about to share with you. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three days, I will rise it up, raise it up. The Jews said to him, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the body of his temple. And he was raised from the dead. His disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone, for he himself knew what was in everyone. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word to us this day. Well, these, these past two weeks and into next week, we've had the joy of having uh, some of our family with us, including grandkids, and, and whenever they're here, I have some nostalgic moments of, of remembering uh, what it was like when we were uh, mother and father, not yet grandmother and grandfather, but raising four sons. And uh, I was reminded of, of some of these things as I was reading a story this week about uh, a mother who was preparing uh, pancakes for breakfast on a Sunday morning before church. And the older kids had come and, and gotten their fill. And, and when the two youngest boys came to eat, uh, there was only one pancake. And mom was busy cooking some others. And so they began, as siblings often do, to argue, each trying to take it and say, it's mine, I'll have it. And, and mom got frustrated with this, as you might expect. Uh, and she said, boys, boys, do you remember what you've learned in Sunday school that, that Jesus taught? And, and one of the boys said, well, yes, he taught us to love one another. And, and the younger boy said, and he taught us the gold rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And, and so the mother said, why don't one of you boys pretend to be Jesus? And the oldest of the two said, you pretend to be Jesus, and he took the pancake. Well, Jesus isn't pretending to be anybody in this story. He is being the Messiah. And it is a powerful story for us to look at. As I mentioned earlier, John puts it in a very strategic place in his gospel at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. And, and the message is that there are many things that are upside down that need to be turned right side up. And that isn't just a message for, for the Jews of Jesus' day. It's a message for all of us because 
part of our sinfulness enables us to, with uncanny ability, get things turned upside down and to think they're right side up. And so if we are to believe like Jesus, we need to be committed to the process of turning things right side up, to see them the way God sees them. That's what it means to believe like Jesus. And this story indicates three big areas. I'm only going to focus on one because I'm guessing not everybody would like to have their Palm Sunday become the major part of, of Holy Week and extend in the next Wednesday or Thursday. So I'm just going to focus on one. And it's important as we read this, this story to understand the depth of the Old Testament teaching that, that goes into this. Even though this gospel was written for the Greeks, there are tremendous references to the Old Testament in, in this passage and tremendous understandings of the Old Testament in, in this whole gospel. To understand this better, we need to get a picture of the temple. It was started by Herod uh, in 46 BC, or I guess at more accurate, probably 16 BC. And it, it took about 60 years to build. And, and at this point in the story, it was year 46. The temple had four major chambers or courts. The first was the court of the Gentiles. That's where they were allowed to be. The second was the court of the women. That's where they were allowed to be. And one of the sad things, if you go to Jerusalem this very day and go to the Wailing Wall, there is a section of the Wailing Wall for the women and another section for the men. Uh, that is a, a, a travesty just as much as it is today a travesty. It was then. But the, the third court was the court for the Israelite men. And then the last court was the court for the priests and the Levites. The courts were ranked in order of their supposed importance of the occupants therein. So the court of the Gentiles was for the least important people. And the women, the next important, next least important. And the, the men, the next least important. And of course, the priests, the most important. And it was in the court of the Gentiles where the money changers worked. You see, every, every Jew within 15 miles, every male within 15 miles who believed in God was required to come to Jerusalem for the Passover and make an offering, a temple sacrifice. And you couldn't bring your own animal. That was never good enough. It had to be an animal without a blemish, and you can just bet that if, even if your animal didn't have an apparent blemish, those who were checking them out would find one. And so you had to buy one from the temple stock. And there were money changers there. And they sold these uh, animals. They, they would change the money so a person could purchase it. And, of course, there was a bit of a commission, but then the money changers added a commission upon the commission. And so if you can imagine this place, it was, it was the place where the Gentiles were to offer up their prayers and, and commune with God. And yet it was like going into the midst of, of a livestock barn. Where, where all the animals are making noise and, and all the other things that animals do. 
hardly a place for worship. So a combination of the fact that, that the place where the Gentiles were called to worship was being used for other things, and then there was the corruption of, of the money changers, was just more than Jesus could bear. The social injustice of this was more than he could handle. And he made the whip of cords and, and drove them out, drove the animals out, drove the money changers out, overturned the tables, and, and returned it to what it was meant to be, a place for Gentiles to be able to worship. What he was doing was not just something peculiar to Jesus. The cause of social justice is deeply embedded in the Old Testament. You remember the story of David and Bathsheba. David sees Bathsheba, desires her, and has her husband, a good and, and faithful soldier, sent to the front lines where he will undoubtedly be killed, and he is. And then David takes Bathsheba to be his wife. And the prophet Nathan comes and tells him a parable about a, a rich man in a town who has all the sheep he can uh, use, but he sees the beautiful you of a poor man and takes it from him because he can. And David is outraged. And he said, whoever would do such a thing as this should be put to death. And Nathan points his bony finger in David's chest and said, you are that man, sir. You are that man. The cause of social justice was brought up by the prophets on numerous occasions. We have the prophet Elijah confronting King Ahaz for taking uh, Naboth's vineyard because he can. Social injustice isn't just a, a matter of the prophets. That goes back to the, to the very core of, of the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. The prophets understood the Ten Commandments in two sections. There, there was the first five commandments were the commandments that pertain to worship and God and the place of God in our lives. And the second ten were, were the social commandments. The interesting thing is when God is in the wrong place, none of the other commandments fall in place the way they should. And so the prophets were continually speaking out against the practice of syncretism and social injustice. Syncretism is, is a fancy word simply to say half-hearted worship of God, going through the motions, worshiping God, but worshiping something else on the side, giving God maybe a, most of our allegiance, but not all of it. That's syncretism. And where there's syncretism, there is bound to be social injustice. For when our relationship with God is out of kilter, our relationship with one another is out of kilter. And the, it's the last of the commandments that is most often abused. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not desire what is not yours, what is not rightfully yours, what does not belong to you legitimately. I was asked to write a paper on, on this uh, for an ordination exam, and, and the basis of what I wrote was that uh, we covet when our relationship with God is out of kilter. 
One person thought that was a fantastic answer. Another thought it was certainly a good answer, and another thought I didn't even answer the question at all. And I realized what the last person might have been trying to, to get at. It's not that what I said wasn't right, but that we need to look at this business of covenanting more in depth, desiring what doesn't belong to us and how that ruins our relationships with one another and ruins our relationship with God. It's, it's a back and forth fluid process. That's what King Ahaz did. He, he coveted what didn't belong to him in Naboth's vineyard. That's what David did. He coveted what didn't belong to him. Uh, and I use that word advisedly because a, a wife doesn't belong to a husband, but uh, he, he wanted a relationship for his that, that was out of bounds. Coveting is when we want something that, that is not ours to have or to be in relationship with. And Jesus saw the, what was going on in the temple as, as a practice of coveting as a practice of, of destroying worship, of going through the motions of worship, but not really allowing worship to take place. I can understand when people say, when I go by the ocean and sit on the beach, I feel closer to God. I've never, ever heard somebody say, when I go into a, a barn, I feel closer to God. When, when I'm out uh, in a cattle pen, I feel closer to God. When I'm, when I'm around uh, a bunch of sheep making noise, I feel closer to God. I've never heard that. And if we are to follow Jesus, we need to take the business of social injustice to heart. We cannot set it aside and say that doesn't apply to us. Much has been in the news these past weeks of two different kinds of things that are both socially unjust. One is the murder of people with, with weapons of destruction. And the other is aspects of voter suppression. Before, before anybody goes crazy with this, let me just give you a couple of facts that were shared with me by, by a Republican strategist. Over the past 50 years, three, over three billion votes have been cast. And there have been verifiable, actual cases of voter fraud 1,500 times. Now, let me put that another way. That includes 2020. But our voting is 99.9999995% fraud free. Or another way to say it is, it is 99.9999995% secure. That's two nines and a decimal point followed by six nines and a five. That's secure. Also, this same Republican strategy shared that over the last 50 years, 1,500,000 people have been killed by guns and gun violence. 
Now, I I know the saying, guns don't kill people, people kill people, and, and there's truth in that, to be sure. But I'd like to offer a corollary to that that I think is even more accurate. Guns in the hands of the wrong people kill people. And we are living in a country right now where it is becoming easier to get a weapon of mass destruction, that is, an assault rifle, in one day than it is for somebody to exercise their constitutional right to vote because of the color of their skin. That is social injustice on both counts. Steve Bragginton had a wonderful uh, post on his Facebook page, and, and I'm going to quote it, and I, and I may misquote it slightly, but you'll get the point. If you want to have open carry and use weapons intended only for the battlefield, take a seat. And it's an army recruiter. It could be a marine recruiter. It could be a Navy recruiter. It could be an Air Force recruiter. Probably not a Space Force recruiter. There is no reason individuals need assault rifles that are meant for war. If you want to fire one, how about if we have ranges where people can go to do that in a supervised way? How many more lives, innocent lives, will be taken? How many more families will be torn by this before we become sensible about it? And it's going to take people like you and me standing up and speaking out and letting our representatives and our senators know where we stand. When I was entering the ministry, somebody said to me, I'm going to give you some advice. Never talk about politics or, or money. And you'll be just fine. It was clear he hadn't read or paid attention to much of the biblical message. Because when Nathan was confronting David, he was taking on the political structure of the day. When Elijah was confronting Ahaz, he was taking on the political structure of the day. When Jesus was overturning the, the money changers and driving people out of the temple, he was taking on the, the political structure of the day. When he went and, and found a man with a withered hand on a Sabbath day and told the man to reach out his hand so he could be healed, he was taking on the political structure of the day. We need to stand up as followers of Christ. It is not a democratic or Republican or independent viewpoint. It is a faith viewpoint of following Christ. And the same thing for voter suppression. When laws are, are written and signed that make it illegal to give somebody water or food while waiting to vote, I guess those who, who get and do that legislation never bothered to read that portion of Matthew 25 where Jesus talks about being hungry and thirsty and being fed. But the deeper thing is that those who make laws like that are coveting power that does not belong to them. They are seeking to seize the power of the people to get their political wishes. And as followers of Christ, we are called to take a stand and to speak out. By the time the 2020 elections come around, I will be retired. But I can assure you of this. If I have the opportunity to go somewhere, perhaps Atlanta, and carry a case of water to people who are in line voting, you can be assured that I'm going to make every opportunity to do that. And if I'm arrested, so be it. 
We are called to be people who follow Jesus Christ and believe as he believes. And on this Palm Sunday, as we go into Holy Week, remember it's things like this that ended up leading to the crucifixion, which ended up leading to Easter. It's a week to reflect and to ask ourselves, what things in our lives do we need to turn right side up? I'm sure there are some things you can find, and it's not just personal faith. It can be social justice as well. We are called to believe like Jesus, to turn the things that are upside down and wrong right side up. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to share and enjoy the special music for this morning. spirit of prayer. Almighty God, you are gracious beyond belief. You have done more for us than we can imagine. You have given us the gift of life. You bless us in ways that, that go beyond what we can count and too often take for granted. But we do give you thanks when we stop and, and pause and ponder the many ways in which you bless us. Make us a blessing for others. Let your love flow through us and touch others, especially those who feel least worthy, those who are brokenhearted, those who are filled with bitterness or resentment, who are locked up in prisons of, of hatred and, and loathing, often self-hatred and often self-loathing. Lord, as we pray on this day, we, we remember all who are battling COVID-19 and those who are being tested and, and receiving positive tests. Those who are, are waiting vaccination and the anxiety that that can bring. And we continue to remember our first responders, our doctors, our nurses, all the staff at hospitals 
and our firefighters and police who, who continually put themselves in harm's way, both in terms of situations and in terms of this pandemic. And be with those who are struggling with other health issues, perhaps nearing the end of their lives. Discouraged, some afraid, some with deep faith uh, awaiting that moment. We ask that that you bring your healing to all and let that healing touch each heart in the way that it is, it is most effective, that you know best. Let us turn our prayer for healing over to you and trust that whatever that outcome is, it will be the best outcome, whether or not it takes place in the form that, that we think of it should. and be with those whose hearts are heavy with grief, who've lost loved ones, especially those who are, are outside of the faith and, and have nothing to, to hold on to, nothing to draw strength from, simply a, a dark pit. when we have the opportunity to, to minister to people like that, uh, give us great wisdom and compassion. And let your love flow through us. Free us from our anxiety of wondering whether or not we will have the right thing to say and just help us to be present and to let you do what you do through us. Be with our leaders at, at every level. Raise them up to be servant leaders. Fill their spirits with compassion, with wisdom, with courage, with determination. We lift up these and all our prayers in the name and spirit of Jesus the Christ. And as his people, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. So be it. And amen. Our closing hymn is again one of the great Palm Sunday hymns. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. I think we had a technical difficulty and we're going to try it again.
invite you to join with me in our benediction. You know it well. We go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. God has a purpose in our being there. Christ who dwells within us has something he wants to do through us where we are. And now as we go forth in this coming week, uh, I invite you to believe this and to go in the joy of God's grace, the joy of God's power, and the joy of God's love. So be it. Have a, have a blessed week. And in a, in a moment following our, our closing, uh, we'll have a time of, of fellowship. And you're invited to be a part of that. Have, have a, a blessed week, everyone. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises to you.